Father, I thank you for the opportunity today to come before you and use our gifts. As Pastor Yana was sharing with the band, and then she came up here and shared before that last song, how she felt so proud of her daughter. And only, as only a parent can know, the challenges and the victories and the defeats going on with each of their children, Lord, that's how I'm pretty confident you see us. So, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, and I ask that the hearts of the people hearing this be open and their minds be ready to receive and be renewed and be challenged, that the Holy Spirit presence here will comfort and convict us, Father, and that a humble spirit is alive and well, and a servant spirit is alive and well, and a sacrificing spirit is alive and well, Lord, to receive this. I thank you. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. So Pastor Candace is going to start out first, and then I'm going to take over. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, for your name is great, and you are crowned with majesty and splendor. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's Psalm chapter 104, verse 1. And as you could feel the atmosphere changed in this place during worship. I know you thought you were just coming to church, but really you were coming to the wedding chamber. Come on. Isn't that how it felt in this place? Becoming one flesh with the king and being in that place where we forget about who we are. We forget about our issues. We forget about sin. We forget about things that restrict us and hold us back, but we become one with him. The importance of understanding his majesty and splendor and how that affects us is key in understanding how we can be and do and fulfill God's plan and purpose for our life. See, you cannot think less of yourself in any respect. You have great worth because he has great worth. See, you are the bride of Christ. See, he is not going to marry less. He is going to marry one that he can raise up and make equal. No man wants to have a less than. A man wants to have an equal partner that will walk alongside him and carry his majesty. Am I right? So our king wants the same thing. So we have to change our thinking and we have to properly position ourselves as the bride of Christ that we indeed are the church that he has called together his one body to walk in majesty and splendor just as he does. Now that's a difficult concept because we'll look at our mistakes, we'll look at sin, we'll look at things in our life, but the resurrection is evidence that we don't need to be concerned about those things because when you walk in the majesty and splendor of God, you forget about things that you do that are wrong and you begin to get swept away in everything that's right. See, that's walking by the Spirit. When you walk, walk by the Spirit of the Lord, you're not going to sin. You're not going to be concerned about what your next move is. Are you doing the right thing? Is guilt and condemnation waiting around the corner? See, that's not what you're thinking about. When you fall in love with somebody, you think about how much you love them all the time and how much you want to be with them. You're not thinking about what kind of mistake are you going to be making. So when we, when we as a church get swept up in the majesty and splendor of God, we become so connected to him. And this is what he tries to teach us in the scriptures about being one with him. You're in a divine union with him. You and him are one flesh. Your one flesh partner speaks right things to you. He talks kindly to you. He only wants to raise you up. He only wants you to be everything that he has ordained before the foundation of the world for you to be. Your only problem is you because you don't see yourself the way he sees you. <laughs> we have to start seeing ourselves as God sees us. When we sing about the majesty and splendor of God, we're singing about the fact that we are majestic and full of splendor just as he is. Because we stand right next to him. We sit on his lap in the heavenly realms. That's who we are. If the church operates like this, we are going to be a powerhouse force on earth. But we have to change our thinking. See, you might have come from a church that told you you were a worm and you were less than and you need to be coming in like this every single Sunday. Oh, my God, I got the weights of the word all over my... No. What kind of church is that? I don't want to go to church. Is somebody going to tell me how bad I am? Why don't you tell me who I'm supposed to be? Why don't you tell me who God says I am? Because I want to raise up and be who God wants me to be. Don't be talking about sin all the time and everything I do wrong. Talk about what he did for me and how he's making me right every day. 
in him. <laughs> See, that's life. That's living. Listen, as husbands and wives, isn't that what we want to do in our homes? Talk to raise one another up. Say the things that are going to bring life and blessing. Isn't that what we want to do with our children? We want to talk right to them so they raise up and be everything that we see they can be. And so when we celebrate the majesty and splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're celebrating that we stand with him, majestic and full of splendor, because that's who he is. You need to slap your neighbor and say, wake up, you're majestic and full of splendor. Come on. He has fun with that one. All right. So, yes, tomorrow starts the month of ER, or it's also called the month of Ziv. You say, ah, oh, what does that have to do with anything? Okay, well, last month was the month of Nisan. It was the first month of the Jewish calendar. This is the second month. I always find scripture to be so amazing because when we know and we understand the times and seasons of God, we know what we should rightly be celebrating. And the fact of the matter is, when he resurrected and he defeated death, he came and he walked the earth for 50 days, right? He walked and he corresponded with people and he connected, but he was in a perfect form, a majestic and beautiful form. And so as we celebrate the majesty and splendor like they are in Israel this time of year, do you know April is the most beautiful month in Israel? Everything's in bloom. And so the month of ER is talking about the splendor of the sun and the splendor of the blossoms that are coming forth and revealing splendor all around. For us, it means the splendor of Jesus Christ himself. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, and of course, um, Pastor Tom stole my thunder. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You're possessed by him. You are his possession. I mean, what kind of protection is that to be the possession of the king? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's what the church is to do. Sing the praises of the one that called us out of darkness and positioned us in light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If you've got an identity issue, look up here because you don't have an identity problem anymore. You are now part of his body, one with him. If he wears a crown, so do you. That's why I said adjust your crown, get it straight on your head. I know you've been through a lot and that crown is falling off yourself, but get it back on. Get that crown back on. When we wear the crown like he wears a crown, doesn't that freak you out that you can wear the crown like he can? Come on. How does that make sense to the natural mind? It makes sense because of scripture, but not from the natural mind. It's a spiritual thing that we grab a hold of. If you wear the crown and you walk with the king, then every decision you make in life is going to look way different than the decisions you're making about right now. Everything is approached differently if we walk in the majesty and the splendor of the Lord. Now, this is the last scripture I'm going to read, and I'm going to pass it off to Pastor Adam. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Notice this is the, the back of the Bible. This is the end. This is the last chapter. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, he is the firstborn of the dead, and the word says that he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Who are these kings? <laughs> Girl, Hallelujah. you could preach this word. We are the kings. We are the queens. We are the priests. 
We are the ones that rule the earth. And we are ruling and reigning today and growing in that only how and by knowing the word of God and letting the word of God change you so that you can walk it out in your environment. When we, the church, begin to live like this, then we are a force that cannot be reckoned with. Hallelujah. That's the bride that God has called to gather together and to represent him. We're to represent the king. How are you going to represent the king if you don't even think like the king? Adjust your crown. Come on. I want to see y'all do it. Come on. Men and women. Let me see it. Let me see it. There's a few who live in by faith in this place. Come on. Get it on right. All right. Adjust your crown. Uh, amen. So, hallelujah. So, as, as those know, that know me, we do things a little differently. So today, with that introduction, I'm going to walk us through one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's a personal letter. It's the book of Philemon. It's only 25 verses. But this short letter is rich with wisdom and guidance on how to live this life. Now, we're supposed to be acting like the royal priesthood. Now, reality is you have to deal with people. You have relationships. So this letter that we're going to go through will help us to understand how we're supposed to live like kings. How we're supposed to live like we're the bride of Christ. How we're supposed to live as a chosen people, a royal priesthood. But you've got to grasp it's dealing with people. Relationships. Okay? Now, if you weren't aware of this, Philemon means, that name means affectionate. It, it actually means to kiss. All right? And this letter was written by Paul. And it was written while Paul was in prison the first time in Rome. He was in prison a few times. This was during his first prison encounter that he writes this letter to Philemon. And it I mean, if you can think of it in today's terminology, I guess Paul was kind of networking. He is networking, right? He wrote letters, and we're reading these letters, okay? So follow along on the screen, and today I'm going to use the New King James Version for this entire time talking about Philemon, okay? So I'm using the New King James Version. We start off with verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So, what we're going to find in this letter is that God's all over. The fingerprints of God are all over this, what we're going to read. And Aphia is the wife of Philemon, and Archippus is likely his son. Um, his name, Archippus, is also mentioned in the book of Colossians, and it, it says in that book that he, must ha he has some kind of standing within the local church in Coloss. Okay, and that's where this house church is. And that's the point. It's a house church. And so you've got to understand something if, if you have church in your house. And, and me and Candace can tell you from personal experience because... We did. If you do this, if it's not from God, it's not going to last. You want to know why? Because you have to have the gift of hospitality. <laughs> why? Well, you have 20 to 40 people in your house every week, if not multiple times a week. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> Just think about the time you have one party. Okay? And then how you usually go through, oh my gosh, I can't have anybody in here because this isn't looking right. Or forgive my bathroom, or for don't go in my bedroom. Well, in our house, every room people went in because we needed this space. We had to have kids' church when we started out. It was in our daughter's bedroom. Everybody's going around. You can't stop that. So I'm telling you, to have house church, you got to have the gift of hospitality. Otherwise, you're going to not be able to do it. All right? Because every week, your house is filled up. All right? 
So, welcome to the first century church. And oh, by the way, how Freedom Destiny started. That's how Freedom Destiny started, if you're not aware of that, 10 years ago. All right, continuing on with verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. This is a great statement here in verse 7, where Paul is saying, that he's always bringing up this name, the name of Philemon, when he prays. And that he always has, has the joy of the Lord and because Philemon is refreshing people. Now let's just pause there a bit. Many of us, many of us process that we haven't been doing anything according to the scriptures because we haven't brought anyone to church. For, let's just use that example. You know? Or maybe you haven't led someone to Christ, or you haven't seen a healing or any miracles. In fact, sometimes folks just get depressed hearing others share their testimony because we'll say, well, what am I doing? My, my testimony isn't like theirs. I didn't do anything special like they did. Well, we need to listen to that right there what Paul was saying in those few verses. Philemon is having an effect, having an impact on the kingdom of God by providing a place of hospitality and a place where believers could gather and be refreshed. I imagine there are some of you right here, right now, that just, what I just described, that, that's you. But I also believe you're getting refreshed right now. You're getting refreshed. You're getting filled back up after pouring out, after a long week. So I want to continue now, because that's kind of the introduction. So that's kind of the introduction. Paul does that in a lot of his letters to the churches. He wrote some personal letters. This was a personal letter. But now we're going to start getting into the meat. All right, so verse 8. Therefore, because there it is, there's the words, therefore. All this stuff, da-da-da. Therefore... Though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I'd rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Huh. Please take notice there at the end of verse 9 that Paul says, he's not a prisoner of the unjust you know, religious Jewish leaders who are actually the ones who put him into this situation that gets him into prison. In other words, this guy Paul interprets everything, everything now, as the hand of God doing this. Therefore, Paul is not a prisoner of the Jewish animosity or a prisoner of the Roman tyranny. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Even if. Come on. This is a hard one. Like, why would God put me in this circumstance? Paul doesn't use any excuse. He could have blamed the Jewish guys that didn't like him now, call him a traitor. He could have blamed the Ro Roman tyranny against Christians. No, 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 no. Not Paul. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I hope you caught, you, caught that. And then let's not overlook what was said just prior to that. See, Paul says... He might be bold in Christ to command something of Philemon. No, no, no. He says, but for love's sakes, I would rather appeal to you, Philemon. So there's two words I want us to focus on right there in that, those few scriptures. Command and appeal. Okay? And this is where it gets a little interesting now. Now this is talking about, you want to be a king's kid? This is how you've got to apply what Pastor Candace is talking about to adjust your crown. All right? What Paul is saying is, I have something I want to talk to you about, Philemon. Now, just put yourself in the shoes. There's probably somebody here you want to talk to them about something. Okay? Specifically now, he's getting to the meeting and he goes, he's going to be talking about a certain slave that was a runaway from you. And Paul goes, I could be bold enough to you, Philemon, to say, because you and I both know who I am. I'm your spiritual dad. 
I'm your spiritual authority, Philemon. I have spiritual authority over you. And you know, I, I believe I have the mind of Christ, and I'm pretty much telling you, this is what you have to do. In other words, I could command you, he says, but I don't want to do that. I would rather appeal to you as a friend. What is going on here, what we're going to continue to see here, is very skillful diplomacy in this dialogue by Paul. He says, sure, I could command you, but you are such a great guy, Philemon, I'd rather just ask you to do it. So let's continue to watch how this goes on, because this is the whole reason for the letter in this very next verse, verse 10. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while I'm in change, which means begotten means while he's been, he ministered to him. He brought him to the knowledge of the word of the Lord. Okay? Now, we're introduced to Onesimus, and Onesimus is a mess. Okay? He was a slave. He worked for Philemon, and he ran away because he stole something. Okay? And somehow, we're not told in the Word of God, Paul and Onesimus meet. We don't know if it's in prison. We don't know if it's while they're in Rome. But they met. And what happens during this dialogue meeting Paul is Onesimus comes to know the knowledge and receives Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Okay? And then, during that dialogue, just think about this in your own personal life. If you've ever done it, remember when you were brought to the Lord Maybe it was in a church setting, maybe, but it's usually you're dialoguing with somebody. And so, during that dialogue is when Onesimus shares the story of where he's at and what's going on and why he's running, okay? And he says, I, I ran from this guy, Philemon, and Colos, and all of a sudden Paul's like, what? Who? I know that guy. I know Philemon. Huh, I brought him to the Lord too, Right? I ministered to Philemon, and Paul realizes, this is what's great again. He's got the finger of God on. This isn't, a, this isn't by chance. This is, Paul did not miss the opportunity, in other words, folks. He knows who he is. He's wearing his crown. He knows who he is. He's the king's kid, and he ministers to whoever comes in his path. He hears this guy's down and out. He'll listen to his story, and he goes, do you know the Lord? Let me tell you about the one that can heal that wound. That's what's going on here, okay? And so Paul realizes that God led Onesimus to him. So let's get back to the scriptures now. Pick it up with verse 10 again. He goes, I appeal to you, Philemon, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. Did you... Did you catch that? Paul is sending the slave back. Okay? Paul tactfully here, skillfully, is asking Philemon to accept and forgive his brother in Christ. Now he calls him a brother. See, before he was a slave, don't miss this in this whole dialogue. Before he was a slave, somebody owns a slave. Now he's saying, hey, Philemon, can you treat him as a brother? Because I'm treating him as a brother. I'm I ain't treating him like he's, I, I own him. He's my brother in Christ. Do you understand? Wherever you're at in your walk with life, if you receive Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters are right here. Doesn't matter you're, wherever you're at. Doesn't matter if you're the CEO or if you're the lowest of the low. Your brother's in Christ. Your sister's in Christ. Mm. So, continuing on in verse 13, Paul goes, Whom I wish to keep with me. I wish to keep Onesimus with me. That on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. I mean, to me, this is funny. Because it's like Paul is talking in classic Jewish guilt. If you've ever seen a Jewish comedian, this is what they do. They just make it sound like the world is caving in on them, but they're fine. Okay? So Paul is saying, hey Philemon, I would prefer that Onesimus stay with me. I'm in a terrible condition, right? I'm, but I'm being optimistic. I'm rejoicing while I'm in prison. And I would rather he stay with me, but I don't want to do anything without your permission because he was your employee, so I'm sending him back to you. 
But then at the end of verse 13, Paul is dropping a hit. He's saying, hey, 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 Philemon, when he returns to you, may, maybe, may, maybe, could you send him back to me? I, I wanted to keep him here. I'd rather keep him here. I need him here. I could use him here. But I don't want to impose. I'm sending him back to you for reconciliation, for restoration. And see, reconciliation, folks, you have to start fresh. Doesn't matter what the circumstances were before. That's the past. You start fresh. Ah, I need to reconcile with my brother Jim. Well, then you better start fresh. That's, how, that's what he's telling. He's telling him, he's going, hey, Philemon, I'm sending him back. All right? So then we pick it up again in verse 14. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. I just want you to do this, Philemon, because you want to, not because I'm forcing you or commanding you. Now this verse here points towards a very important topic. Leadership. Many times, see, many times, people miss what is the underlying thing going on in a story like this. It's leadership. It's spiritual authority. Folks, in, all, in almost all matters of leadership, it is preferred that people do things from the inside out rather than the outside in. What I, what, meaning, in almost everything, it's best if things are done voluntarily, vice ordered to do. Right? In other words, we do things because we want to do them, vice, well, they told me to do it. How many times have you run, and this may be you, how many times have you run into somebody at a store and things don't go right and they go, I don't know, I just work here. I mean, you might have used that. I did when I was in college. I remember I worked at a, I, I, it was a sporting goods store that I worked at at some times, and I, I was a terrible employee, but you know why? Because my manager was, I found out later, terrible manager. He, all he did was talk against the company, told me I could take stuff. Yeah! Uh, just take some stuff. It's a leftover. Do an inventory. We won't miss it. Well, you know what? When leadership's that way, no wonder the place sucked and went under. Right? But I'm just saying. So, you got to understand. That's, that's why a servant's heart, a volunteer's heart, you can, a volunteer. That's why, like in World War II. World War II, we get attacked. All the guys sign up, right? Those guys that got 4 f Coded, meaning they had like some kind of problem physically. They were not able to go join any of the services. Are you aware that a majority of those guys that didn't go committed suicide? Because they couldn't go and fight for their country? A little bit opposite than today. And, and oh, by the way, back then in the 40s, uh, all the movie stars, all the athletes went in, by the way. They did. Not today. And today, most of the military guys that have, commit suicide are, are in the service. It's just, a different, it's just different. We need to understand this. It's the truth. Okay? So, it's better if you have a volunteer heart. A volunteer. You, man, when a volunteer wants to do something, get out of the way and let them do it. You know? Give them the guidance. Give them the tools. And let them go. And say thank you. Okay? So, picking it back up in verse 15. Now, this is Paul again talking to Philemon. He goes, For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. Like, in other words, Oh, Onesimus might have left. God's got this all ordained. For this whole reason, that you can learn how to forgive. Ooh, that stings a little bit. Right? Because you're going to be brothers now. No longer as a slave, here it is, but more than a slave, a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? See, see right here, Paul is emphasizing that the Lord has you guys as brothers, Philemon. Here on earth, yes, one is an employer, one's the employee, but in the spiritual sense, you are actually brothers. We are all sheep of the Lord, are we not? Okay? In other words, the barriers of the past, the desertion and the theft by Onesimus should divide you guys no longer. Okay? You are now one in Christ Jesus. This, is, this dialogue here, this letter, is a masterpiece displaying grace and tact. Right? 
if you aren't already, um, you know, asking yourselves, you should be asking, what barriers are there in your life? Like already, if you haven't started to do that, like what barriers are present in your homes? What barriers are present in your neighborhoods? What barriers are present in your church family? What separates you from fellow believers? Is it the color of your skin? Is it your status in the community? Is it wealth or lack of wealth? Is it education? Is it personality? This, folks, is a powerfully loaded 25 verses of Scripture that God uses to call us to seek unity and break down those walls and embrace brothers and sisters in Christ. See, in this time when this was going on, the Greek, the Jewish, and the Roman cultures all had a lot of differences. And it's, what's birthing out of this is this new Christian culture that Paul's talking to Philemon. Philemon's doing house church in Colossus. Slave runs away. Paul runs into the slave. Slave receives the Lord. Apparently the slave didn't receive the Lord when he was with Philemon. Think about that. So Paul's going, okay, pal. We've got to straighten out a little bit of thinking there and call us in your, your church, in your home. Okay? So, picking it back up in verse 17. And then you can count me as a partner. Receive him. This is Philemon. Receive Onesimus as you would receive me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, here's the kicker. Put that on my account. Put it on my tab. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand, so it's legal tender. Could, uh, Philemon could take this to the, any of the court and go, um, Onesimus owes me, you know, whatever. How many denarii? Whatever. Owes me this much. Paul says, I'll pay the bill. I will repay. Not, now, here it goes. I will repay. And then he goes, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. In other words, just charge whatever he has done if he owes you anything to me. This is legal tender. But, not to mention, you owe me your whole life. Ah, but that's beside the point. See what I'm getting at? See how this is funny? You're getting it now. Hallelujah. Okay, it must have been my for giving it to you, you didn't get it. Because I think this is hilarious. Right? That's this beautiful Jewish negotiating skill being displayed. Paul is basically saying in our language, Philemon, dude, come on, stop it. You owe me and I never collected. Don't you collect on this guy. You and I both know this same scenario was played out years before with you and me. And I forgave you. I mean, it just, it's just kind of funny. All right? Then verse 20. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I've said. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. In other words, yep, I know I'm in prison right now, but things are wrapping up here. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to be out soon, and I'm going to come and visit you. Which means, which means, and all this saying, Philemon can be going, yeah, right, no way. And then he puts that at the end here. Paul goes, yeah, I'm going to come visit you and see how you're treating Onesimus. Right? That's what's going on. So then Paul wraps up the letter, and verse 23 he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. So there's a little tidbit. Guess what? If you hang around with Paul, if you hang around with people that are really walking in the Lord, you're going to get in prison too. That's the deal. Philemon 24 and 25 ended it up. He goes, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So what he ended up with here, he's got Mark. Now this happened to be uh, John Mark, who we know as Mark, wrote the book of Mark. But Paul and him had a little falling out, if you know your Bible. Early on, Paul, Barnabas and Paul were going to go somewhere. Mark was kind of young, apparently. Paul didn't agree with him stopping and not helping at one side, maybe coming up with a lot of excuses. Barnabas, a little more tender, said, come on, you come with me. Paul's going on his way. He's going on his journeys. You come with me. So now, Paul and Mark have reconciled, okay? And then this guy, D Demas, who at this point is faithful, serving with Paul, but if you know your Bible again, 
he leaves them and basically turned from following the Lord because he was too into the world. It says in 2 Timothy 4.10, if you want to do a little research, so all, you, all, all you're going to find on him, but he leaves following the Lord because he loved the world so much. That's no different than today, is it not? Right? And then he ends with Luke. I mean, Luke is faithfully stayed with him and wrote the book of Acts following him and, you know, wrote the book of Luke. And Luke was the only Gentile. So, you know, that's kind of these guys here. So let me try to, like, wrap this up. You know, because I think this is very important. Paul receives somebody, this guy Onesimus, who's running away from a relationship. See, you might not have looked at it. He's running away from a relationship. Running away, in other words, from a place he's supposed to be. Now, this one gets a little, it's going to be a little hard for some of you to hear. We just witnessed again this process of spiritual authority within this story of Philemon. And what am I getting at? Quite frequently, people are leaving the relationship God put them in. In other words, many people will leave one church and hop to another church and hop to another church and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, most pastors act as though they're in competition with each other. And when somebody talks to them about, you know, the other church, they might listen and assimilate all these stories into something, but they don't really do anything to the person telling them about that. Well, if you know me, if some of you have had this happen from me, you're going to nod your head and go, yeah, he did that to me. If I hear folks talk like this, like if you tell it to somebody else and I hear it through them, I don't go after you. But if you tell it to me, this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to instruct you to go back and talk to that shepherd. Tell that pastor whatever's on your heart. And if you want to leave, you tell him you're leaving. But you need to receive his blessing. If he doesn't give his blessing, that's on him. But you need to do that. And I, I've had people, when I tell them that, they don't like that. And then I don't see them. <laughs> because I believe that this is so critical. Now, the, the band can make their way back up here. See, what I believe I'm doing by doing that is I am sowing something into the spirit realm that is honoring the kingdom of God. What that really means is in the natural is I didn't want to receive anyone into this ministry that was running from some place that God had them unless there was a blessing in them coming. Amen. Now, does that make sense? Yeah. See, the Bible talks about this in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's servant or spouse. <laughs> Apply that to all the churches around here with people hopping around. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, Covetedness is the desire to have something that is so strong you are willing to violate the principle of God in order to have it. Think about this. What do you think, if, if somebody does what I, that's come that way, that hasn't got, what do you think that pastor or leader at a different place thinks about me if that person told them that I said to do that? You know what that is? It's like asking for a handshake in the spiritual sense of cooperating for the kingdom of God because it's much bigger than that church. It's much bigger than that pastor. See, I can honestly tell you, this year, I am working diligently on tearing down strongholds in this area between shepherds, between pastors here, all right? It's hard, but we're on a journey, and I'm making progress. I am. So this story about Philemon is a powerful teaching about the spiritual authority trying to reconcile people with each other, not to compete and take and covet, which doesn't build up the kingdom of God. The story of Philemon is that Paul is encouraging him to receive back Onesimus with the right attitude about someone who has wronged him, but now, Philemon, let repentance, let forgiveness, let restoration take its rightful place, and then treat him as a brother. And this was all done while Paul was in prison so that he's being fruitful in every good work, multiplying the kingdom of God 
through constraints of his current situation. So I say that because there are some of us who are using an excuse of, I can't do that right now because I'm constrained. I can't do that because I have no resources. I can't do that because I don't have the time. And I think we need to repent of that because we can do that. We can humble ourselves and forgive. We can humble ourselves and go back and share the truth about something that may have hurt you. Share what is bothering you so that your relationships can be restored with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if you're out there and you're going, man, that's pretty cool, but I don't have the strength to do that. Here's the deal. You don't have to. You just have to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he'll give you the strength to do it. Because in the natural, I can tell you, I can attest, it ain't going to be done in the natural because I'm too big-headed and strong-headed to do that. But the love of the Lord that he showed me was in me, so I could go do that. That's what you need. We partake in communion here. It's another way to worship him besides the singing. We partake of it because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's, in, it's throughout the back where you see the lamps, the lights. And you do this simply by taking part of the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represents his body and his blood. And we do it to remember the sacrifice Jesus Christ made for all of us so that we could right, correct our relationships. The altar team will be up here. They're here if the altar is open. <laughs> it's always open. But it's here so that you can maybe go to the Lord about some things and maybe right some relationships that have been like split ends that need to be closed off properly. I ask us all now, to come to our feet and continue praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.